or at home, uh, we welcome you and uh, hope that the service is meaningful to you. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. The Lord be with you. How majestic your name in all the earth, O Lord our sovereign. In the fullness of time, you crowned creation with the birth of your Son. Please join me in the opening prayer. God of new beginnings, you are the prayer of our tears, and call us to care for one another. Give us eyes to see your gifts, hearts to embrace your creation, and hands to serve you every day of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Opening hymn. No little ones coming forward today, but uh, um, there might be some watching, and I see some who are remaining in their seats, which is fine. Um, so today is New Year's Day, the beginning of a new year, and in our opening prayer, uh, we're called, coming, looking into the new year, give us eyes to see your gifts hearts to embrace all creation, and hands to serve you every day of our lives. So sometimes uh, when we start a new year, we think about something called a New Year's resolution. So something you're resolving to do, and uh, we're resolving to embrace all creation and use our hands to serve God every day of our lives. But I just want to give you uh, a little bit of time 
uh, maybe 15 seconds or something, to think about the last year and think of a time that you felt blessed, that you felt God's presence and joy in your life. All right, and now I want you to think of a time you felt maybe you weren't living up to your promises to serve every day or to see our gifts. Maybe something you feel like you might want to do a little better in the new year. And we'll call that your New Year's resolution. So to start the new year, we're going to have a little meditation. So you at home, close your eyes. This is a meditation for children, but we're all children of God, so everyone from zero to 102 can participate. So the first thing I want you to do is close your eyes. Imagine you're walking in a park. You see a group of people ahead, and they seem excited about something. Huh. Maybe there's a movie star. Maybe they're filming something in my area. Then you hear a voice say, don't keep the children from me. Let them come to me. Even though you've never heard that voice before, you recognize it as Jesus. And you sit down next to Jesus with the other kids. Jesus looks at you and says, thank you for what you're doing, for what you're resolving to do in the new year. Uh, you're not quite sure what to say. You stammer and reply. You haven't actually done it yet, and you're kind of afraid you might make some mistakes. Jesus tells you, that's okay. The important thing is that you're trying. Then Jesus talks with the other kids. You hope you get to talk to Jesus again before he has to leave. Think in silence now about what you'll say to Jesus if you get the chance. Jesus says he has to go, but first he turns to you and asks if you have anything to tell him. You tell Jesus the thing that you were thinking about. He thanks you and then says goodbye, but he'll be with you. Reflect for a short while in silence on what it felt like to be so close to Jesus. Open your eyes and welcome the new year. The scripture today is from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will 
be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning and the end. Word of God for the people of God. So uh, today uh, we were planning to have uh, Leslie Hernandez here as a guest a soloist, but this morning she woke up with, um, she, was, she was feeling pretty under the weather, so any prayers for her recovery or in this healing would be much appreciated. Uh, so today I'll be playing an arrangement of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Uh, and what came to mind is uh, at Jesus' birth, the, the angels that came, uh, the multitude of the heavenly choir singing praises to the most high glory to God, uh, that uh, our Savior, um, God, was born uh, in the flesh um, to save us for those who believe in him. Uh, so, and I don't know of any other accounts where angels actually sing about anyone <laughs> other than God. So, um, well, Jesus is God, but I mean, any other, you know, person. <laughs> so this is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hello? There we go. All right. Good morning. Happy New Year. Um, first of all, uh, say thank you to everyone uh, helping make this service possible. For our one-woman tech team in the back, uh, Debbie, thank you so much. Uh, for Kevin, uh, for Christy, for Rod and Barbara, and uh, we're sorry that uh, Leslie's not feeling well. Uh, I was looking forward to that, but... Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, again, thank you, and uh, again, Happy New Year. And just uh, after Barbara's uh, children's message, just curious, uh, anyone make a New Year's resolution this morning? Anyone break it already? <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, as I was going through the, the lectionary, uh, I talked to Pastor Jim a couple months ago about preaching this Sunday, which it didn't quite put the pieces together that it's New Year's Day, which means New Year's Eve, you know, we're up kind of late and all that. Um, but I was reading through the, the lectionary passages, and there's actually three sets of readings for today. So, like, three sets of, like, the gospel reading, the epistle, and all that sort of stuff. So there's plenty to choose from. Um, 
And this one kind of jumped out at me, the, the Revelation passage, uh, because it, it seemed a little odd that we would have, at the beginning of the year, something about the sort of new beginning or the, the end of, of this current age and, and the beginning of, of a new age. Um, but it, it just kind of uh, you know, kept coming back to it as I re- read through them. That was the one that kind of kept coming up, and, and so I wanted to, to share some thoughts with that. Um, but bef- before I get into some of those thoughts, I just want to kind of give credit where credit is due. Um, a lot of what I want to share comes from um, several pastors and teachers that uh, I listen to. Um, I've kind of moved on from audiobooks to podcasts on my hour plus drive to, to work every day. And a lot of uh, theological ones, a lot of uh, biblical studies and stuff like that. If, if you want recommendations, I'm happy to give them to you afterwards. But uh, the, the two that kind of uh, informed and spoke into this message most, uh, one is uh, this guy, uh, Marty Solomon, uh, with uh, Bema uh, Discipleship. He's uh, a biblical teacher, um, but also uh, Jewish by heritage, so he brings a lot of that understanding into uh, you know, not only the Old Testament scriptures, but the New Testament and, and the gospel. Um, so I uh, really enjoy listening to him. Uh, he uh, sits under and learns from a, a lot of uh, really great rabbis who uh, inform a lot of his understanding of things, which he then shares on his podcast. And then uh, the other one is the Voxology podcast. Uh, it's guy Mike Erie and, and Tim Stafford. Uh, the, the, the bald guy is a, a teaching pastor in Tennessee. The other one is a, a, a college professor in, up in Northern California, and they do a lot of biblical studies and kind of current issues and stuff like that. So a lot of what I want to share comes from, from them. So um, as I read uh, through the, the passage, um, what kind of stood out to me, and part of it was from what uh, Marty Solomon was saying, because um, he does kind of a, a Through the Bible series that started, I think, five or six years ago in, in the book of Genesis and kind of works its way through, was that there's a lot of interesting connections between uh, this passage in Revelation that, that Christy read for us and what we see in the original Genesis account. Um, for instance, uh, we have the mention of a new heaven and new earth, and in Genesis 1-1, we're told, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, in Revelation, it talks about how there is no more sea. Um, and in Genesis, it says that the spirit hovered over the, the sea. Um, and just, you know, for those of you who still surf and all that, uh, that's not to say there's not going to be any beaches or waves or oceans. Um, but that the sea was actually, in the ancient Near Eastern mind, uh, an idea of chaos and uncertainty and danger. So basically to say that that chaos is, will not be in this new creation. It's not, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully still have our oceans. Um, so good news for our surfers. Um, and then, you know, again, both in Genesis and in Revelation, it talks about how God dwells with, with God's people. Um, and uh, so kind of where I want to go with this is, you know, when we look at this description of the new creation, when we look at the description from Genesis of the old creation, um, we're reminded, one, uh, who God is, two, who we are, and then thirdly, how God wants to partner with us, uh, that God wants us to partner with him in restoring creation and bringing about this new creation that is uh, described in, uh, in Revelation. So let's look at uh, what we can learn about God, uh, first of all. Um, so first of all, uh, the idea that God brings order to, to chaos. And um, what we see in that, uh, one of the interesting things in looking at the description uh, from uh, Genesis, and again, this is something that uh, Marty Solomon spends, I think, you know, several hours of his podcast talking about, is the way it kind of fits into this sort of poetic pattern. That it's written, you know, these first chapters of Genesis are written as poetry and, and written more to kind of tell us who we are or who God's people are and who God is in that relationship rather than trying to describe, you know, this is what happened in, you know, six literal days. You know, it might have been that, you know, God created in six literal days, but basically the, the point that, that he makes it and the point, you know, I want to make is that that wasn't necessarily the, the intention. The intention was to show that God is a God who creates, a God who brings order from chaos Um, Because a lot of these ancient uh, civilizations and these ancient cultures, and uh, I I, uh, teach at uh, Santa Monica High School a folktales and mythology uh, senior level English class, 
And we started off the, the semester with uh, creation myths from all around the world. And uh, basically, they took these creation myths and turned them into children's stories and uh, shared them that way, um, which got really interesting because a lot of these other ancient uh, civilizations and cultures, their creation myth involves a lot of violence and a lot of battling between the gods. And you know, basically, the, the humans are, are there to kind of join forces and pick sides and you know, we're gonna fight for this. And basically creation came out of a lot of chaos and violence and warring and things like that. But g our God is different in that, you know, first in the, the, the first three days God creates or sort of carves the, the space out of chaos. And then in days four, five, and six, God fills that space. Um, so it's a very ordered, very patterned uh, way of, of going about doing that. And uh, one of the interesting things uh, about that, there we go, too many sets of notes here. There we go. Um, one of the, the interesting things that uh, Solomon points out in, in his discussion is that you know, God is not only a God who creates and, and brings order from the, the chaos, but God is a God who knows when to stop, when to stop creating. And we see that at the end of the, uh, the, the week of creation that says God rested. And it's not because God was tired, that God overexerted you know, God's self or anything like that, but it's that you know, God said, okay, it's, it's done, it's finished. We can sit back and, and enjoy it. And, um, you know, he, he uses the example of uh, Michelangelo and the, the sculpture of David. Uh, that, you know, in carving, you know, it's, you know, let's chip away and chip away until we have the, the sculpture. And there, there came a point where Michelangelo would have said, okay, it's done. And knowing that if he, you know, took one more swing of the hammer and one more, you know, chunk out of that, that rock, that it wouldn't be as good. It, it would have ruined it. So that's sort of what... Uh, he, he says here, and, and one of the other things that, that kind of points to this is, um, I'm going to get a little English teacher here for a minute, um, this idea of, of a chiasm, which is a poetic device where it's a, a pattern, um, you know, I wish I had a, a board I could write it on, but um, where basically it, it goes, the, the text goes to the, the middle in a pattern and then either repeats that pattern in the second half of the, the passage or does it in reverse? So it might be like A, B, C, D, you know, going through the, the things. And then on the, the second half would be either A, B, C, D again, or D, C, B, A. So, you know, it kind of works that way. And if we go back and look at um, the, the, the days of creation, maybe. Can we go back a slide or so? My, the rope's not working. There we go. So we, we, again, see that pattern where, you know, on day one, God creates light and darkness, you know, creates a, a space, and then on day four, he fills that space with sun, moon, and stars. God creates water in the sky, God fills it with fish and birds, God creates uh, land and seas, and, you know, then fills that with the animals and, and, and humans. So one of the, the interesting things that this sort of chiasm points to is usually Whatever's at the middle, that's kind of the, the, the treasure, as, as Marty Solomon puts it. And what we find there is that in that middle part is the, the Hebrew word for, for time or seasons, and it points to this idea of rest. That you know, God is one that will, will step back and enjoy God's creation and invites us to, to, to do the same. That you know, we're invited to uh, take time off uh, from our work and, and to enjoy the, the fruits of our labor. Um, so, uh, we learn about God, that God brings order to chaos, God knows when to stop and to take a rest. So things that we learn about ourselves, so the, the first thing uh, to consider is looking at who would have heard this story first, you know, back when Genesis was first written and when these stories were first told. You know, we have the uh, ancient nation of Israel who... You know, you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, Jacob's, you know, Joseph goes down to, to Egypt. Uh, there's the, the famine. You know, Jacob and his sons go down to, to get food. They, they're reunited with, with Joseph. And they live there. They're there for some 400 years. And they, you know, very quickly after the, the Pharaoh, that, or very quickly after Joseph passed away, 
the, pharaoh, the, the new pharaoh came up and enslaved the Israelite people. And so they were enslaved for 400 years. You know, I mean, we think back 400 years, it, you know, we can't even really think back that, you know, it's like colonial period um, if we think back that far. Um, so that's, that's all these people have known is this. And now they're being liberated. They're being brought out of this life that they've lived for generations. And now they're free. And all they know of themselves is that they were enslaved. And all they knew about themselves in that 400 years of enslavement was that their value as people was in what they could produce, which was bricks. But, you know, that's what the, the Bible says. They, 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 they made bricks for the uh, Egyptian builders. Um, but then, you know, Moses comes along, God liberates them, and says, no, you are no longer enslaved, you are free. And your value is not in what you can do and what you can produce, but your value is in who you are as, as God's people. Um, so that uh, kind of points us, you know, that, that they were to be set apart as different from the other nations. And God established that, that covenant and that relationship. And also that they are invited into this idea of, of the Sabbath, of, of that period of rest. Um, that, you know, because as people who are enslaved, they don't get a day off necessarily. It's just work until you can't work anymore and then you're discarded and uh, replaced. But now it's, you know, you, you can enjoy that rest. So looking at what that says to us as Jesus followers today is that we too have a, a new identity. That we were once, uh, as, you know, Paul and, and other uh, writers in the New Testament tell us that we were once enslaved by, by sin and death, but now we are free as God's chosen people. That you know, we're often told that our value is in what we produce, but now our value is in that relationship, and particularly in our relationship as people who, who bear the image of God. Um, So one of the um, interesting things about that idea of, of image bearing, um, this is from uh, Mike Geary and, and, and things that he's talked about in his podcast, is that in addition to this kind of poetic structure that uh, Marty Solomon talks about in, in Genesis, that a lot of the language talking about you know the, the first humans, uh, Adam and Eve, is temple language, it's priestly language, that the, the, the verbs used to talk about the work given to Adam and Eve are, are the some of the same words used to talk about the work of the, the priests in, in the temple. And basically the idea that the, the garden was God's temple space, and we as humans are one, you know, the, the, the priests of that. But in these ancient cultures, they would put a, an image of their God in that temple. And, you know, it might be a statue, it might be some sort of, uh, you know, painted image or whatever. But... God placed his image on us, that we are that image in, in that temple space. We point to God. Um, and as such, you know, we're invited to be God's partners uh, in this work that God wants to do and to participate in that rest that, that God uh, has for us as well. Which leads to that third point, uh, that you know, what we learn about this partnership with God. So basically, uh, you know, going back to the, the, the title of my sermon, uh, which was New Year, New Creation, Same Old Job to Do, is that our purpose since the beginning of humanity really hasn't changed. That our, image, or our purpose is to fill creation with, with God's image, uh, to be God's representatives to this world. And as we've seen, not only throughout you know, the entire uh, you know, 66 books uh, of the Bible, but the 2,000 years of history after that um, is that we see a lot of pollution in that creation through sin and chaos. That, you know, we were given the, the, the job of maintaining creation, of, of filling it with God's image, and yet, you know, we have thousands of years of history of pretty much doing the opposite, of, of doing a pretty good job ruining it. Um, now, some might be tempted when we read the, the passage from Revelation to just kind of sit back and say, well, you know, God's going to take care of it in the end. You know, God's going to take care of it. So what, why should we? You know, let's just kind of sit back, you know, kind of like in a, a football game. Let's just 
you know, run out the clock and you know, we'll, we'll celebrate our, our victory in the end. Um, but that's not what God wants, I, I believe. I, I believe that what God wants is for us to fulfill that purpose, to fulfill that, I, that identity as uh, his image bearers, and to partner with God in restoring creation back to that original state. So what does that look like? You know, sounds great. Let's, you know, kind of restore factory settings, so to speak. Um, too bad we can't just press a button on our phone to, you know, restore everything back to the way it should be. Um, so, uh, fortunately, um, we have an example set for us uh, in, in the Gospels. Uh, we have the person of Jesus who shows us what it looks like to display God's image and restore the, the brokenness in creation. Um, one of the things that... that kind of jumped out to me a while back about, you know, the, the miracles of Jesus, which, you know, we love to read the stories of, you know, Jesus healing the, the blind and the sick and the lame, uh, or the, the crippled and, and all the, you know, so, well, look at, at what Jesus did, that it wasn't just a matter of a, a physical healing, but it was giving them their, their life back or giving them a, a life to, to begin with, that it was, you know, these people were just sort of a, a, a drain on society. They, they really had no value. They, they really had no way to contribute to anything. Um, and Jesus comes along and not only heals their physical body, but gives them a, a life, gives them purpose, gives them the ability to, you know, again, continue to, to partner with God in, in that. Um, so we've got, you know, again, four Gospels that uh, demonstrate that for us. But then also... Um, Jesus tells us pretty specifically. And, you know, as kind of this message came together, uh, one of the other passages for the, um, from the lectionary was Matthew 25, uh, which is a passage that's probably familiar to uh, a lot of us, um, where Jesus says, uh, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did uh, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So, I mean, we've got basically the in instruction manual. And, you know, again, kind of back to... to you know, the example of Jesus, that it wasn't just Jesus being nice. It wasn't just, you know, you know, look at me and, and how great I am and these cool powers that I have. But it was giving people their, their lives back. And I think that's the, the same job that we're called to do, that you know, we, we do these things. We, we feed the hungry. We uh, offer a drink to the thirsty. We um, invite in the, the stranger. We clothe the, the naked. We uh, look after the, the sick. We visit the, the prisoner, not because it's a nice thing to do or it makes us feel good, but it brings about that wholeness and that completeness that God desires. It, it sort of restores those factory settings for those that, that we reach out to. Um, sorry again, too many sets of notes. So, um, again, what might this, this look like? Uh, we've got the examples there. Um, you know, and, and we have, uh, you know, in the, the, the passage, uh, when you know, Gabriel tells uh, Mary that you know, she's to, to bear the, the son, uh, to, to bear Jesus as, as a child, it says that you know, his name is to be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And you know, we had God incarnate you know, as that you know, kind of perfect example of an image bearer, one who came to kind of set things right and to restore uh, the, the brokenness uh, around him. Um, but then also we have that same spirit dwelling within us, that we have you know, God's spirit and, and we can act in the, the, the same ways as, as Jesus would. Um, so I want to show you this poem really quickly. There we go. So this is uh, a poem called uh, Midnight Christians. And... Um, Kind of an interesting backstory to it, and you'll kind of see where this goes in, in a second when I flip to the, the next slide or two. Um, but this was written, uh, it was, I believe, in, in France. There was a, uh, a church that, or might have been cathedral, but a, a church that uh, was refurbishing and dedicating a, an organ for their 
uh, for their church. And they wanted, you know, someone to write a, a special song for, you know, or a poem or song for this, uh, for this dedication. And so they got, you know, the best poet around, um, who interestingly happened to be an atheist, which, you know, I thought that was uh, kind of an interesting piece of the story, but wrote this. Uh, and this is a, the, the translation from the, the French. It says, Midnight Christians, it's a solemn hour where the man God came down to us to erase the original stain and of his father to stop the wrath. The whole world trembles with hope. Uh, sorry, there's a glare. On this night that gives him a savior, people on their knees await your deliverance. And then going on, the, the Redeemer has broken every hindrance. The earth is free and the sky is open. He sees a brother where he, only, where he was only a slave. Love unites those enchained by iron. Uh, who will tell him our gratitude? Read off the back, that might be easier. Uh, it is for all of us that he was born. Uh, may he suffer and die. People up, sing your deliverance. Let's sing the Redeemer. And then uh, when this was then later translated and adapted and put to music, we have the, the song, O Holy Night. Uh, the, so that's kind of the, the backstory and history of that. Um, so uh, just there's a couple lines that, that I wanted to call attention to in this. Uh, the one is, let's see, it's four lines or three lines down where it says, Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And it's a line that, you know, I'm sure we've all sung, you know, I don't know how many, you know, however many Christmases we have, plus, you know, sing it two or three times a year. Um, Again, it's just kind of one of those lines that, yeah, that's, that's nice. And then I heard um, Father Greg Boyle, who is, uh, he's a, a, I'm not sure, either Franciscan or Jesuit, I, I don't remember which order he belongs to, but he's a, a parish priest down in uh, Boyle Heights, uh, Los Angeles. Um, he's the, the founder of Homeboy Industries, which um, basically is uh, trying to offer, you know, gang members and those who uh, don't have a lot of the advantages, you know, those that would kind of fit into that description from Matthew 25, uh, to basically give them jobs and to give them a life. And, and you know, they do uh, free tattoo removal for gang members so that they can, you know, be a little bit more presentable when they, they go, you know, for a job interview or, or, you know, just lots of things and just all these lives that, that have been turned around. And he, he spoke about this that, you know, it, it's amazing what can happen in a person's life when they feel their worth, when their, their soul feels their, their worth. And, you know, he has story after story. Um, uh, he has a, a wonderful book, which I, I'd highly recommend, uh, Tattoos on the Heart. Um, they just kind of story after story of these uh, gang members and former gang members that uh, he was able to, to minister to and, and impact and, and such. Um, but, you know, he's still doing his thing down there and, and you know, kind of one of my, my heroes of the faith. Um, but then the, the, the third verse, which this is just the first and third verse, so I took out the, the second one, uh, where it says, Truly he taught us to love one another, his law is love, and his gospel is peace. Change shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy and grateful chorus we raise, let all within us praise his holy name. And one of the, the interesting things you know, that I learned about the, the history of, of this particular verse was that... 150 years ago or so is actually kind of a controversial verse and in parts of America particularly in the you know south you know kind of pre-civil war and even after you know, during reconstruction and such that they didn't want to sing this verse because it talks about uh, the, the slave being our brother and oppression ceasing and all these things you know just recognizing the, the dignity um, and the worth of, of our fellow human beings um, even though they may look different from us. So it, it was just, you know, it was kind of shunned in, in the South, but also became sort of uh, one of the abolitionist uh, anthems and uh, in, in the North and in places that, you know, people sang it as, you know, hey, this is what we need to be doing. Um, so to, to kind of wrap things up here, um, did I have another slide? I don't think I did. Um, I, I hope and pray that uh, in this new year that we can remember, first of all, who our God is, that our God is one who creates order out of chaos, 
that we can recognize who we are, that our value is not in what we do and what we can produce, but in who we are and in whose we are. And then lastly, that we can partner with God in bringing about the, the new creation that, that Christy uh, read to us about, uh, and that we can go out and that those who encounter us, uh, you know, wherever we are, that their soul will feel their worth, that chains will break, and that we'll realize that anybody, uh, whoever they are, wherever they are, is our brother or sister, and that we can you know, live out the, the mission uh, given to us by example through Jesus and told to us uh, in Matthew 25. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we have so many needs and wants, and and you know them already. Uh, But Jesus taught us that you want us to come to you in prayer because he frequently went off and and prayed to you. And so we follow Jesus' practice by bringing our needs and wants to you at at this time verbally. Uh, We have some newer uh, needs that we want to bring up. Uh, Kathy Martin's aunt Dorothy, who is 95 years old, is hospitalized and in failing health, and we ask that uh, you watch over her and give her caregivers uh, wisdom so that they can take care of her. Uh, we also have the family of uh, Dick upon his passing. We ask that you uh, are with them and Debbie and her family, uh, the family of her grandma Jeannie, that you're with them and give them um, comfort. Uh, Mary Beth has, is healing from a foot injury and that's uh, rather on the new side. Um, we also want to remember that there are many recovering from flu, COVID, RSV, and please be with them and their caregivers. There's too many times we have to mourn um, Roger and Carol with the passing of her mother, with Patty and family with the passing of her husband. Um, please watch over those that are mourning and uh, give them comfort and bring their uh, past ones to be with you in heaven. There are many in recovery uh, and healing and we pray for the caregivers that are taking care of them. Uh, Roger, Joanne, Angel, Tony, Tracy, uh, Seely, Amber, all of them need your help and your uh, watching over them. Um, We have many people, too many people, in cancer treatment. And again, Lord, we ask you to be with them and with their caregivers, Georgia, Joanne, Karen, Logan, Rita, Bill, Heather, Debbie, Joshua, Ruby, Ariel, Dick, Romana, Bob, Gonzala, Tony, Sylvia, Joey, Melissa, all of them are meaningful to us and we know they're meaningful to you, Lord. Um, In hospice care, we have John and please watch over him and his family and ease him into his next phase. Uh, As we transition from needs to praises, um, we have Allie and Will who are expecting identical twins, certainly a praise, but they've had some difficulties and certainly some needs and wants in that area. Uh, And we are so happy about baby Ryland and our new rose up on the altar. And so thank you for that that new birth and bringing uh, baby Ryland into the world safely. Uh, And finally, I want to, uh, we want to pray, recognize that we're praying together today with other churches throughout the world, and especially Woodland Hills United Methodist Church, 
and Westlake Village United Methodist Church. Westlake is part of our Caneo Connect partners, so it's a special connection we have with them. And finally, we'd like to close with the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer that Jesus taught us, and it's something that we can always um, turn to you when we're praying. Please pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And our closing hymn is uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Uh, and what came to mind is uh, one of my favorite prophecies out of the whole Bible, which is in Daniel 9, uh, 24 through 27. It's uh, when Gabriel came to uh, Daniel as he was praying at the very end of the Babylonian captivity for the children of Israel um, for a solution. And actually what he received was the vision that Gabriel gave him, which was the ultimate solution where he prophesied Jesus is coming, being sacrificed, and uh, as propitiation for the sins that we owe you know, from our sin debt. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't checked out that 70 Weeks Prophecy, it's um, one of the most accurate and precise prophecies that leads right, pinpoints right to Jesus' um, birth, uh, life, death, and resurrection. <laughs> so, uh, here's Go Tell It. Oh, that's the other thing. Yeah, Go Tell It on the Mountain. The reason why that came to mind is because sometimes when we want to share the good news with, with um, non-believers, um, we sometimes don't know what to say, but sometimes we could point to the prophecies, the fulfilled prophecies, and the accuracy of them uh, to, to um, confirm the validity and the uh, the, the, the truth that's found in, in God's word. So, uh, yeah, so the prophecies are, are useful tools sometimes. <laughs> so here's Go Tell It on the Mountain.
receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in this day and in this new year. Amen. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll do life of the church. If, unless you... Okay. The other day I thanked Julianne for always leaving us just with a burst of energy, doesn't she? It's really great. Uh, so life of the church, uh, first of all, uh, introducing Raylan Lieblad. There's the little girl. Um, Pastor Jim starting a new uh, study series on Tuesdays at 10 in the morning, beginning January 10th, The Life of Faith. Uh, there's also Carol starting a new study series on Thursdays at 1 in Camarillo or Friday here. So there's two different sessions covering the same material uh, for the Camarillo people and then the Newbury Park people. Uh, we have family ministry nights. Uh, their Canal Connect is meeting now at Thousand Oaks UMC starting January 17th. And it'll be Tuesdays. I think it was Wednesdays for a while, but now it's going to be Tuesdays, 5.30 to 7.15. Member dinners provided, uh, and all ages are welcome. Uh, the altar flowers here, these beautiful yellow, just uh, representing friendship, new, year, new life, provided by Kevin and Debbie Dyer in honor of their many 2022 blessings. And we should all look back to 2022 and remember our blessings uh, there is Coffee Fellowship after church, and Suzanne Ford welcomes you to join her uh, in some fellowship after church. So, St. Matthew's, welcome home. Oh, wait, wait, wait sorry, birthdays. <laughs> so, tomorrow we've got uh, Wendy and Dennis, and then Carol Tripp, Merle and Freeman, and then on the 6th, Emmy St. Ledger. So, let's sing happy birthday to them. slide for this one? St. Matthew's, welcome home. All right. <laughs> 